Max Payne came out in 2001, video game shooters were toys. After Max Payne, shooters were an art form. They were all dead. The final gunshot was an exclamation mark to everything that had led to this point. I released my finger from the trigger, and then it was over. This amazing introduction is just the first of countless jaw-dropping moments in Max Payne, the 2001 action thriller most famous today for its invention of bullet time. Press a button during gameplay, and the on-screen action briefly slows down, enabling the player to aim and shoot with much greater precision. Remedy, the Finnish studio who created the game, borrowed the idea from John Woo's greatest Hong Kong action films, which slowed down time during epic gun battles. Unlike films, where the audience doesn't control the camera, Max Payne lets the player trigger bullet time. But the greatness of Max Payne wasn't just its superb gameplay, it was also its story. Like all the great film noir tales of the past, Max Payne succeeds because it has great characters, great plot twists, and great suspense. The script for the game was written by Sam Lake, who almost single-handedly created the genre of video game noir. Lake created a rock'em sock'em story which grabs you by the throat and never lets go. Most of the cutscenes take the form of a graphic novel which paints the scene while the voice actors deliver the lines. This was a clever strategy because the computer hardware of 2001 could not render faces very well, and the pages of the graphic novel perfectly matched the game's film noir style. We had been snowed from the start in the Valkyr case. The forecast said there was plenty more where that had come from. What makes the whole thing work is that Max is not a superhero. He's just an ordinary cop put into an impossible situation. It all starts when thugs murder Max's wife and baby girl. The people he loves most are gone. Everything ripped apart in a New York minute. The story of Max Payne is the story of his revenge. In the late 1990s, Remedy was a small, obscure group of artists and programmers based in Finland. With the help of American gaming publishers 3D Realms and Gathering of Developers, Remedy found some excellent voice actors to play the characters. The standouts are James McAfee, who delivers the performance of a lifetime as Max Payne, and Dominic Hawksley, the voice of Vladimir. If you want to get to Ponchinello, you will need heavy-duty persuaders. I am just the man to get them for you. Max Payne also had one of the best musical themes ever created for a video game, a sequence as mournful as it is memorable, created by Finnish composers Kertsi Hataka and Kimo Kajasto. Back in 1998, Half-Life revolutionized video gaming by creating playable textures, surfaces so realistic they compensated for the limited 3D visuals of the day. In 2001, Max Payne took the next logical step by filling in those textures with wall picks, textures stamped with a specific content or meaning. This meant everything from graffiti tags to satirical corporate advertisements, similar to what Rockstar did with Grand Theft Auto 3, which also came out in 2001, only with a much gloomier tone. One of the most important wall picks we see early in the game is a poster for the Acer Corporation. Now, I know you Americans in the audience might be disturbed, but what looks like a reference to 9-11, calm down, it's not what you think. Max Payne was officially released in July 2001, a couple months before 9-11. The Twin Towers are just a symbol of New York City. In fact, some of the other wall picks in the game show the Brooklyn Bridge, the Empire State Building, the Statue of Liberty, and so on. But the poster of the Acer Corporation is just brilliant. The skyline shows Lower Manhattan, New York's financial district, and the location of Wall Street. What we have here is the definitive post-mortem of the 1990s dot-com bubble. The Twin Towers are disappearing to suitably Norse cloud and mist, and the byline reads, a bit closer to heaven. Now, the word bit is a computer pun. Eight bits make a byte, which is the standard metric for information storage. But what Max discovers is that the head of the Acer Corporation, Nicole Horn, is far from an angel. In fact, her corporate empire is creating hell on Earth. 
In retrospect, Remedy made two design decisions which turned Max Payne from just another shooter into a classic. First, the entire game takes place during an epic three-day snowstorm, which shuts down the city. This not only made the game's storyline credible, there's no way Max could have escaped from the police in normal weather, it also made the game playable because the game didn't have to render huge crowds or traffic jams. Instead, the artists could just render the buildings, put some snowflakes in the air, and hey presto, New York City turns into a winter action wonderland. The second decision was careful attention to realism. The team visited New York City, took all kinds of digital photos, and used these as reference models for the game. This is important because Max Payne really couldn't take place anywhere else in the world. New York City is the home base of Wall Street, the global headquarters of neoliberalism. So what the video game does is to show how badly neoliberalism is wrecking the place. So in the first part of the game, you're fighting against mafia goons. By the second part of the game, you're fighting against mercenaries. By the end of the game, you're fighting against high-priced corporate killer suits. The single greatest symbol of neoliberalism in the storyline is Valkyr, the bright green designer drug which is wreaking havoc on the streets of New York City. One of the characters in the story calls Valkyr the devil's green blood, an important hint of what it symbolizes, and Max keeps running into vials of this stuff throughout the story. Believe it or not, Remedy borrowed the whole idea for Valkyr from Half-Life's giant green pools of radioactive waste. In Half-Life, the toxic waste pools were a symbol of the horrendous ecological price tag the United States and Russia paid to construct their military-industrial complexes. Max Payne takes this symbol one step further. Valkyr does have a connection to the military-industrial complex, but it symbolizes something else. Green dollar bills turned liquid, aka speculative financial liquidity. It's a metaphor of the securitized assets being churned out by Wall Street investment banks during the bubble years, which would crash and burn and nearly take the entire world economy with them. In the end, the villain Max is fighting isn't the Azer Corporation, it's the entire destructive system of Wall Street neoliberalism. That's why Max Payne is something important to teach us about neoliberalism. Because neoliberalism is not just a tiny group of Wall Street plutocrats fleecing the planet. It's also a mentality, a way of thinking closely tied to transnational consumerism. That's why it's something potentially inside us all. And by us all, I mean all seven billion of us on this planet. Here in the first world, neoliberalism ruled by spawning the biggest credit bubble in human history. Outsourcing and union busting drove wages down, so ordinary people had to borrow like mad to keep buying all those transnational consumer goods, till the whole thing blew up in 2008. In the rest of the world, neoliberalism inflicted terrible damage in Latin America, Africa, and Asia, but not because colonial armies invaded those countries and told them what to do. It was because neoliberal elites in those countries inflicted austerity on their own people, all in the name of making all those transnational consumer goods accessible, but that never happened. These elites wanted to be like Wall Street and, unfortunately, succeeded. That's why, before Max can launch his final assault on the Acer Corporation, he has to overcome the most dangerous opponent of all, himself. No one is going to rescue us from neoliberalism. We citizens of the planet have to rescue ourselves. Yeah.